I think is going to be really a part of what I'm going to share with you today. So just taking a, the introduction for a little bit in terms of their words and lyrics as part of the inspiration of this moment. Thank you very much. So, yes, let's give him a hand. I appreciate that. Um, so, I have this elevator time pitch in terms of talking to you about what's on my mind, and two things really come into my mind. It's really a um, whole aspect of equity, obviously, and the other one is innovation, and how do we protect innovation within our, this equity question. And, you know, there's something that's constantly on the news nowadays, and that's the whole aspect of income inequality. You can't stop hearing about it. Just recently, they announced that the majority of the wealth of the world is in the hands of 1% of the people. And if you listen closely to what uh, Dr. Darlin Hammond said yesterday, something really, really staggering. The majority of public school students in the United States of America live in poverty for the first time. But more importantly than that, to me, is the acceleration of that poverty. Ten years ago, only four states had a majority of students living in poverty. Today, it's 21. So it's accelerating. So in a room full of innovators and leaders, who are doing equity in the school and doing it well, I'm challenging you to look forward and understand that more and more students are going to come with that challenge of living in poverty. Now, being poor is not determinative of your life future, but certainly the pathologies of being poor, you're far more susceptible to it. And those pathologies are things such as homelessness, family breakdown, dysfunction, life's instabilities that lead to school not becoming a priority. So we have to ask our questions, no matter, or ask ourselves the questions, no matter what we're doing in terms of equity, what are we doing to make sure that over time that we're going to be prepared for those young people who come? So, you know, with that, I think about the fact that at High School for Recording Arts, we have been sort of like the canaries in the mine. Back in 1998, we were created because young people were going to a recording studio that my partner, David T. C. Ellis, started, and they were passionate about their music. They wanted to learn how to get it out. They wanted to learn about copyright, trademark, all of these things, but none of them were going to school. Practically. All of them were living in poverty. And the reasons for them not going to school was just endemic in terms of their communities. Yet, he saw in them the genius of each of their, their minds, their creativity. And we basically created the high school for recording arts on top of that recording studio. We had the young people. So with that, we were able to build student enterprises and an opportunity for those young people to explore their creativity in a way that they never had before, in a way that had adults and responsible adults and creative thinkers working with them to show them how that creativity could be something not only as a change agent in their communities with projects we've done around things like HIV and uh, STD prevention, um, um, environmental justice and the dropout rate, but also just in terms of them seeing that that creativity, people around the world want it. It has, it's a part of a multi-billion dollar industry. So that became our charge. But at the same time, at the High School for Recording Arts then and to this day, 98% of our students live in poverty. 78% of them are, have dropped out before they came to our school. 50% of them, close to 50% are homeless. 
But that's not what drives us. We build our program and our students upon that creativity and that talent. So that led to all of the projects I mentioned, but in addition to that, um, we, we need to show that we can compete in the world. And innovation is, to me, one of the most important things we can do for our young people in terms of equity, or any child. But I say especially those who are poor. So what we have done is we've taken that business enterprise model and we joined Junior Achievement. Anybody here familiar with Junior Achievement and what it does in terms of helping young people create businesses? And then they compete against other um, uh, students around the, their area, then around the country, and at least to these world championships. So our students, using their student enterprise of creating media content for business businesses and connecting that to um, their radio show that they operate on a, on a weekly basis on an FM station. They created a business, and I'm going to show you a video of that business that they created. This could be you right now. If you're a business owner within the Metro, let HSRA and Junior Achievement leave your mark everywhere with a unique custom radio advertisement with cutting edge music created in our state of the art studios. This could be all yours for an incredible affordable price. For more information, contact Leave Your Mark Everywhere at Lime at HSRA.org. L-Y-M-E. I hope these guys can do something for me. Hi, you ask for Lime? We're going to leave your mark everywhere. We give local businesses the opportunity to be recognized by making a 30 second jingle which airs on 96.3 Now. After your 30 second jingle, we give you a two minute spotlight segment where we talk about your business. Are you interested? Yes. Well, let's get the paperwork ready. We finished your jingle. How about you take a listen? Alright. Now, Thank you. That's achieving at a high level. And for a second, I want to challenge, uh, channel Jeff yesterday. You know, what the fuck happened that that isn't recognized as achievement? And I've been thinking about it. And, you know, I'm a transplant from New York to Minnesota. And when I first got to Minnesota, I learned that um, through my love of public radio that everyone is above average. And I figured that. Since I now was paying Minnesota taxes, I was above average too, so I was really happy about that. But I also learned that that above average meant that Minnesota was one of the highest achieving states in the nation in terms of reading and math. But then I learned it was also above average because it had the largest achievement gap, the biggest difference between black students, especially black students and white students. One of the top in the country, the gap. So the question became, you know, what is this achievement gap? And the sad part of it is that that has led the equity question since then, closing the achievement gap. I want to share with you really quickly um, something I learned from two great thinkers in Minnesota, Ted Coldry and Bob Wader, who run an organization called Education Evolving. And they challenged us on thinking about that achievement gap. Because they're saying, and they're saying things like, if a student is starting on the, uh, start at the starting line in a 100-yard race, and another student is on a 50-yard line, and the gun goes off at the same time, and they're racing, how is that student going to catch up to compete? Does, you know, is that realistic that they're going to really make that time up? Or does that person in the, in the lead have to slow down? And it really challenges our ideas around achievement. So in the very short time that we have our students, what are we really focusing on that's going to give them the best chance to succeed? And my sense is that is what we do here in this room with our schools. One thing to think about is that um, at High School for Recording Arts, we're in a space where we're trying to make up 
the difference of young people who grow up in difficult circumstances to try to have them believe in themselves. You know, one of the things that about achievement is that we feel that naturally that's their own, the only way that they're going to succeed is making up the difference in terms of reading and math. But that's not really how we even raise our own children. What we do is when they're born, we're trying to give them hope. We give them a safe space to explore and be creative. We want them to learn how to learn and love to learn. So by the time they go to elementary school and they're doing reading and math, they're not doing it, at, doing it as an end. They're doing it as a tool to maintain and still drive that, lo that love of learning. That's what we need to be doing with our young people. Think about the fact that when Uber was talking the other day about his experience as a young person, when he, all the things he went through and all the challenges he went through, and when he was about to give up, he had a word. It was called hopelessness. We're trying to build hope in young people. So I'm, I'm just wedded to the idea that we have to face the fact that we're going to have tremendous challenges on us by a system that looks at achievement in one way. And the fact that we're wedded to innovation, but believe me, from my experience at High School for Recorded Arts, the system wants you to change. They want you to do better in their context. And we have a saying at High School for Recorded Arts that came from one of our education directors, Paula Anderson. We're not trying to improve to to serve better students. We're trying to improve to better serve the students we have. That's what it's all about. It's not about trying to have them conform into this, into this um, matrix around closing an achievement gap. It's about giving them the sense of possibility that they can do anything. Thomas Friedman, who wor wrote the book, The World is Flat, people familiar with that book, because he was a wake-up call to America. Um, all you know, we were in this globalization competition now. And now with technology and globalization, we're, going, we're competing against the whole world. And the things that China and India are, are doing in terms of education, you know, we have to figure out how we're going to deal with this. And the book became a bestseller, you know, New York Times columnist. And he tells a story where he was in front of a group of soccer moms. And after he gave his presentation, all of them, they were in a suburb somewhere, they were asking him, what courses should my kid take? What should they major in in college? What should they do to deal with this situation and, this, and to confront what you're talking about? He said he wasn't ready for, oh, for, the, for the, uh, you know, how, how much they were pushing him on this, and he had to give himself pause, and he thought about it. He said, you know, the best thing you could do for your kid is to find a teacher who loves them and knows how to turn on the light to have them love to learn. We have no idea what the best major is going to be 10 years from now. Give them that love of learning. That's the best that you could do for a young person. I want to show you right now um, a video to complement what you saw in terms of line. Now, these are students that meet all of the indicators that I mentioned to you before in terms of some of those consequences of being poor. They put together this business line and they competed against some of the best schools in Minneapolis, St. Paul. They won. They went to a regional um, competition and they won that. What you're going to see now is a video when they competed on an, at the North American Championship in Washington, D.C. It's going to be terrific if you take first place up here today. But if you don't, the sun is still going to come up tomorrow. You are still going to be successful. You have every opportunity. The students here have been involved with JA for uh, a school year. They're here competing against other kids around across America. These are the future entrepreneurs. Um, it's not just uh, putting a company together, but it's involvement with other kids across America. It's inspiring leaders. Um, some creativity, inspiration, passion, perseverance, 
the people that are watching this video right now, you are the future leaders of America. All right, I know everybody's been waiting for this. So, the first place team winner from St. Paul, Minnesota is Team Live. I'm going to end with a quote that I know many of you have heard. Do not train a child to learn by force or harshness, but direct them to it by what amuses their minds so that, they, so that you may be better able to discover with accuracy the peculiar bent of the genius of each. Thank you.